a Portland Community College Mathematics Telecourse. A course in arithmetic review produced at Portland Community College. Before discussing the multiplication of fractions, let's recall a fact from whole numbers. You might recall from elementary school geometry that if you have the length of a rectangle and the width of a rectangle, let's say the width is 3 feet and the length is 5 feet, that the area is found by multiplying the length times the width. So area in this case would be the length, which is 5, times the width, which is 3, which is 15. Now, it turns out that if you count the number of squares here, one all the way up, you'll find, in fact, there are 15 squares. So if we were to draw small squares within this rectangle 3 by 15, one can look upon area as a way of understanding what product is. Now let's apply that to fractions. Let's start now with a rectangle where the entire rectangle stands for one whole. But 5, 6 says subdivide it into 6 parts and take 5 of them. So if I were to subdivide this into six parts, I could take five of them. Okay, but this fraction says no, subdivide in two parts. Well, let's subdivide the two parts this way. So if we're looking this way, there are two vertical strips. So we have two parts. If we're looking this way, there are six horizontal strips, so there are six parts. So if we take 5, 6 down, we have that. But if we take only one half across, like width and length, we have this. And if area was what you got from the product, a width times a length, or a length times a width, what we get is this. We get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 small subdivisions of the large whole. So we get 5 parts out of a rectangle that has been divided, in fact, into 12 pieces. So you see, there is an analogy between the whole number multiplications as represented by rectangles and a representation by fractions, but now where the rectangle is one whole subdivided into pieces. Now notice this, though. I could have got the same number by simply taking that numerator times that numerator, and that gave me my answer numerator. And this denominator times this denominator to get my answers denominator. As some of you might recall it, top times top to get top, bottom times bottom to get bottom. And indeed, that is the case for multiplication of fractions. Just that simple. So in short, to multiply fractions, to get the numerator of the answer, you multiply the numerators of the factors. To get the denominator of the answer, you multiply the denominator of the factors. And then, of course, always stop to see if it's reducible. In this case, 2 will go into there 3 times, and 2 will go into here 10 times. So my answer, 3 tenths. However, it's not always that easy. In fact, not very often. Now, let's consider this very messy one. If I were to multiply that top times that top times that top to get to my answers numerator, I would get 
16,380, a very messy number. Then if I were to multiply the denominators of my factors to get the denominator of my answer, I would get 43,875, extremely messy one, with a whole heap of reducing to be done. And quite frankly, I'd rather not do it. It's just too much arithmetic. However, recall from our previous lesson on reducing, if the top and bottom are in factored form, and we're certainly going to multiply these and these, you may divide any amount you wish into any top factor providing you divide the same amount into some bottom factor. So I notice I can divide this one by 5. And that rule says fine, providing you can divide one of the bottom ones by 5. So in this case, either this or this. Either will do. I'll pick on this one. Had I done this, that would be fine. And since we're crossing out in each case when we divide, that's where the name canceling comes from. Now, is there any other dual factors where I can divide or cancel? Well, yes. In this one, I can divide both of these by 9. 9 into 45 is 5. 9 into 18 is 2. Anywhere else? Yes, this isn't quite as obvious, but 13 will divide both of these. 13 goes into here twice. 13 goes into here three times. Now, the only ones I have on the bottom are fives and threes, and that won't divide into the tops, nor they into them. So, multiplying what's left, and I have seven times two times two, which is four times seven is twenty-eight, and the bottom twenty-five times three is seventy-five, and this is the same as that and reduced. So it turns out I did not have to do all of these multiplications. What this is saying in effect that when you are multiplying you can reduce before you multiply not after. And furthermore you can not only reduce up and down you can reduce in all sorts of crisscrossy patterns. Let's summarize that rule. That's a very valuable one. To multiply two or more fractions, eliminate all common factors in the numerators and denominators. That's what we call canceling. Write the product of the numerators over the product of the denominators. In short, cancel first, then multiply the tops to get the new top, the bottoms to get the new bottom. Now please note, canceling is only possible with single fractions and between fractions which are being multiplied. A very important note for later lessons. Also note that if all possible canceling has been done, then the product is in reduced form. That's a very handy device. Let's summarize with one messy problem. And this indeed would be messy if I were to multiply all of those and then all of those. But this rule says first cancel. That is, can I see any pairs of top and bottom that I can divide jointly by the same number? Well, in this case, I could divide both of these by 4. Anything else? Well, yes, I can divide both of these by 7 and see where you cancel or divide is totally irrelevant as long as it's top or bottom. Okay, anywhere else? Well, yes, both of these by 11. Anywhere else? Well, both of these by 3. And while you're watching this, you can probably see other ways I could have done it. Anywhere else? Yes, these two by 2 or these two by 2. So let's do these two. Anywhere else? Well, both of these by 7. Anywhere else? Well, both of these by 5. 5 goes into here three times. And not so obvious here. We'd probably have to use scratch paper or a calculator. 
but it goes in 19 times. Now, the only thing that's left on the bottom is 19, and 4 and 3 on top won't divide into it. So 4 times 3 is 12 over 19, and it is reduced. Very nice, very easy. And as it turns out in later work, particularly in science and technologies, multiplications of fractions is that operation which is done most frequently. And it just happens to be the easiest one to do. Let's work one more problem and make a very important stressing of a particular point asked frequently by students. Notice that 5 goes into here. So the question is, I must divide 5 into a bottom factor. So I, do I divide into this one, or this one, or into both? Again, note that the cancellation law says I must divide any top factor by anything I want, providing I find a bottom factor to divide by the same amount, 5. It said a bottom factor. It didn't say any particular one, so it is my choice to factor cancel into this or this. I will choose this. The question frequently asked of me in class is, what would have happened had I canceled into here instead of that? And the answer, it makes no difference. In the end, the products will be exactly the same. So we can see that once again I could divide this fa top factor and this bottom factor each by 5. Now again note, I can divide this one by 7, but on top either this or this. The choice is yours. So I'll just go right straight up. And again recall that you can always cancel up and down even when you're not multiplying because that's nothing more than reducing. But if you're canceling across operations, you can do it only across multiplications. So in this case, I will note that both of these are divisible by 3. So I do it. Then both of these are divisible by 2. So I do that division until finally on top I have 1 times 1 times 7 and on the bottom 1 times 11 times 2 is 22 and I have my results which is already in reduced form. Let's spend just a few minutes taking a peek ahead in mathematics and science and show you just how important a simple little fact like the multiplication of fractions and the cancellation law can be. Let's say in a science class your task is to convert 660 feet to miles. Let's say you're sure that it's only a fraction of a mile, but what fraction? Now watch this train of thought we're going to play with. First you will be asked to realize that this isn't the number 660 with a little word foot tacked onto it, that you want to look upon this as a multiplication process. It's the 660 times a unit of foot. That we actually look upon this sort of as a number and we look upon this as di a distinct multiplication. Then let's assume that we look into a table of conversion values and we find that 5,280 feet or 5,280 times feet is one mile or now one times mile. Now in order to say equal here we're saying these two are the same number just measured differently. Now note what I can do. We know from a previous lesson that if I take any number 
and divide it by 1, it's still the same number written in fraction form. We also know that the one number I can multiply by, which will not change any value, is 1. But we also notice that if I write any number divided by itself, where A here stands for any number, it's always equal to 1. Any number divided by itself is 1. So what I'm going to do is to write this form of the number on the bottom. And in just a moment, you'll see why, I hope. But then the top must be equal to the bottom so that I know that I'm really multiplying by 1, which tells me I'm not changing my number value. But this says that this is equal to it. So the net effect is that I'm multiplying this number, 660 times phi, by a strange looking 1. But now notice what I can do here. Because I am multiplying fractions, I am permitted to cancel. I can cancel feet into feet, top and bottom, because we have already stated that anything into itself is 1. So feet into feet is 1. Feet into feet is 1. That's a rather strange way of looking at this, but you'll find in science it's the usual way of looking at it. Now I can divide this number by 10 and this number by 10. I can see I can still divide each by 2, so this by 2 and this by 2. And if you look carefully, you will realize I can divide by 11. 11 goes into 33 three times. 11 goes into 264. 24 times. And finally, 3 goes into this one once, 3 goes into here 8 times, and multiplying what I have left on top, I have just a 1 times 1 times mile, which is 1 times mile, over 1 times 8. So we are claiming that 660 feet is, in fact, one-eighth of a mile. So you can see, later, we're going to use this process of multiplying fractions and the process of cancellation, along with a new way of looking at our denominant numbers that we worked with in elementary school. We're going to use all of that to form a device to allow us to routinely convert from one unit of measure into another unit of measure, and you'll find it will become a very simple, very simple process, all based upon what you are learning right now. So be assured that what you're doing, although it's simple, is going to build into something intensely important. Now. Let's return again to a review of least common multiples from chapter 2. We are really emphasizing the importance of this, aren't we? And we are doing that very deliberately. First, and at the lowest level of our very lengthy review, it's important that you know exactly what we mean by a statement like this. Find the least common multiple, which we usually abbreviate by L, C, M, least common multiple, of, say, 6, 9, and 12. I can find the least common multiple of two numbers, 
or three or four or five million if I wished. So I want to know something relative to these three particular numbers. So have a crystal clear notion in your mind what is meant by the phrase least common multiple of a series of numbers no matter how long that series is. And of course restating this question differently we could ask what is the lowest number that each of these three will divide into? Now no, we don't want to know what number will divide into these. The lowest number of course would be three. But we want to know what the lowest number each of these will divide into. Well, go to the largest. Obviously 12 is the smallest that 12 will divide into. Six will divide into it, but nine won't. Now if I were to take the next multiple of 12, which would be 24, 6 will divide into that still, but 9 still won't. If I were to take the next multiple of 12, which is 36, of course 12 goes into it three times, but now 9 divides into it four times, and 6 divides into it six times. So this is the lowest multiple that all three of these will divide into evenly. So that's what we mean by the lowest common multiple of a series of numbers. Now we could have started with the multiples of six. The first multiple of six is 12, then 18, then 24, then 30, and then 36. And again, 36 is the first and lowest multiple that all of the others will divide into as well as the original number 6. And we could have done the same thing with 9. The second multiple of 9 is 18. The third multiple is 27. Now see, 9 will divide into 27, but 6 won't and 12 won't. The next multiple of 9 would be 36, and sure enough, all three numbers will divide into 36. Now, if we were to continue this stream of multiples of each of these, we would eventually find another multiple that all three would divide into, and then another, and another, and another, and this process goes on forever. So 36 is the least of all of those common multiples. So we concluded chapter two by finding lowest common multiples of numbers where it's not obvious what it is by inspection alone. And as we started this review several lessons ago, we eventually want to conclude our review by asking what is the least common multiple of these two. That is, what's the smallest number that each of these will divide into. And again, we know it'll have to be something larger than 1,386 because it's the first multiple of this number itself. And our claim is going to be that that least common multiple, in fact, is the large number, 38,808. It's very large, but it's the smallest number in existence that each of these will divide into. So as we begin to build this review in the next few tapes, please keep cleanly in mind what we mean by the least common multiple. That is the smallest number that exists that every number in our series will divide into. If you have that as a firm basis, then our review will go well and problems which will come to us later in this chapter will become very easy, which otherwise might seem to be very difficult. Therefore, let's take one more problem by looking at it from this particular approach just to get a good idea what we mean by that least common multiple. Then we'll continue this review over the next few tapes. First, we can find the largest in the series. It's its own first multiple 
Then we ask, will any of these divide into it? Well, 3 will, but 6 and 4 